The more that God gives me to share with you out of this epistle, the more I see how relevant it is for this body, for this age. We dealt last time with reproof where Paul rebuked their deception, how easily people are turned to substitute religious experiences and substitute gospels for the Word of God. Well, we had about an hour and a half on that. Tonight, we come to vindication. Vindication, where Paul is defending the divine source of his message. But that isn't all he's doing because God has a lot to say. In fact, he's already given me five or six messages just on that part that we need. So I want to begin tonight with verse 11. We dealt with verses 1 to 10 last time. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my life in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And the accusation of the Judaizers is that he doesn't have a direct revelation or a complete revelation. But he said, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them that were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. And by the way, the New Testament shows he spent three years there and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days, but other of the apostles I saw not except James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he who persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God in me. And then after fourteen years I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation, and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in, privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Amen. But of these who seem to be somewhat, and whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. Remember the message Sunday night, Paul was not impressed by anyone's position or degrees. If their opinions ran contrary to the word, he was dead to that. He was dead to everything in the world. So he said, it didn't matter to me who they were, for they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, the gospel of the circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen and they to the circumcision. Now that's as far as we're going tonight, even though vindication is from 111 to 221. But tonight we want to deal with just the first aspect of verses 11 and 12. You recall last time, by the way, when in verses 6 and following, Paul pointed out that anyone who perverted the gospel of Christ was under the curse of God. Now that's pretty strong language, we know. The Holy Spirit does not mince words about those who pervert the scriptures he inspired. Now most people, as I said last time, have the idea that perversion means some great heresy. You know, like denial of the blood atonement or Jesus became a sinner on the cross or whatever and became impure and subject to Satan, as JDS heresy teaches. It's some great heresy, you know. And they don't realize that most deception and error that delude people is quite subtle. And so Paul vindicates himself here, and he doesn't hesitate to do it, because he has heard from Jesus, and he knows that if he compromises one iota of this gospel, that he's going to have to answer to him. And so 
Occasionally we will hear people say, I've even had them write me on occasion, you know, that you're coming on a little too strong and how are you going to win people if you don't have a positive message? And they will complain and murmur if the word is a little too strong for their weak hearts or weak faith. But you see, a man that God has called really doesn't have any choice. He has a choice of pleasing God and sometimes displeasing some people or pleasing the people and being displeasing to God. That's really the only choice he's got. And so really he doesn't have a choice. And there are many references in Scripture which will show you that. And we're going to vindicate our strong message to you tonight because that's what Paul's doing in Galatians. And we're going to vindicate to you tonight from the Word of God our strong message because we don't apologize for it. We hope everybody that hears it will receive it. We know that everybody that hears it won't receive it. But you see, if you read passages like 2 Timothy 4, where God says you better preach that word, instant in season, out of season. If you read passages like Ezekiel 33 and 34 and Jeremiah 23, you'll see that we don't have any choice. In fact, I'd like for you to turn tonight to Ezekiel 33. Now I'm going to show you from the Word of God that anyone who waters down or compromises the Word of God at all, God says the blood of the people is going to be on your hands. I'm going to require their blood at your hands. And if you want to see why I fear God more than men, turn to Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Son of man, speak unto the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him there for their watchman. Now the watchman is the minister. Obviously you'll see that he's the preacher of the word. They set a watchman. And when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Now the watchman stood on the wall. You know they had the walled cities. You can still see some of them today. Like the castle, you know, surrounded by a great wall. Jerusalem still has the wall, the old city. So he says, if they take heed to your warning when you blow the trumpet, they deliver their blood. But if they don't, it's on their own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the minister's hand, the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. And when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Now God says if you warn the people, you deliver your own soul. But he says, when I set a minister in the pulpit, when I raise up a prophet or whatever, teacher, and he doesn't warn the people, if he isn't faithful to my word, I'm going to require everyone that sat under his ministry and perished or didn't even fulfill my will in their life, I'm going to require them at his hands. He'll pay for their failures. If you'll turn over to 2 Timothy, I just want to read that quickly before we get into the vindication of the ministry God has set us in. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now any minister that God calls is under a solemn charge, and here it is, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach that word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers who will say what they want them to say. They have itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and make full proof of thy ministry. Now God has never called any man, never raised up any prophet, never anointed any teacher to go tell people what they wanted to hear or what was pleasant or what wouldn't hurt somebody's feelings or offend them. But he solemnly 
in both the Old and New Testament warns them that if they do not speak the word, if the watchman doesn't blow the trumpet, if he doesn't warn them, if he doesn't obey, then God is going to require their blood at his hands. With such solemn charges in both the Old and New Testament, any man that God's called doesn't have any choice but to obey. That is, if he regards the security of his own soul. And those who water down and distort and substitute creeds for the word of God apparently don't regard or value their own soul. Because God has said he's going to charge the blood of anyone who perishes that's sat under their ministry. And of course there are other scriptures to show that my people perish for lack of knowledge and he calls them his people. So if he isn't faithful to God's people who already have delivered their own souls by believing in Christ, God's going to hold them accountable because the Bible says you can perish for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. God is going to require at the hands of every one of you, whether you're a word minister or not, what your testimony tells people, how you live before them, what you say to them. Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, he says that people who compromise his word substitute creeds for his word. He says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Then he says something that I think half the people who read it miss it. He said, In vain they worship me. You know what it is to worship God in vain? It means he isn't listening. You're wasting your time. In vain they worship me who teach for doctrines the commandments of men. It's a vain abomination. God isn't listening. He isn't receiving. He isn't accepting their worship. But that doesn't mean anything to people who can't endure sound doctrine. He said the time would come when they couldn't. So it doesn't mean anything that he said that to people who can't endure sound doctrine. If you think they can endure it today, I challenge you to take some of the clearest teachings of the Word of God, present them to the average Christian, charismatic or not, and see if they will accept that in place of their creed, where the creed disagrees with what God clearly says. They will endure unsound doctrine, but not sound. What is more sound doctrine than Acts 2.39? Where Peter said the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to you, to your children, and to all of them that are far off, even as many as the Lord your God shall call to salvation. Amen. And how many do you know who can endure that sound doctrine? Most can't. You know that. I don't have to tell you. If you could, why, we would need a bigger tent than Jack Cole had, and it's seated about 10, 12,000. And what is sounder doctrine than what God clearly says we are to do as a church when anyone gets sick? Nothing can be plainer than what the Holy Spirit said. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Not the doctors, the elders of the church. That's our commission. It doesn't matter what the world or Warsaw or the medical community thinks about it. That's our commission. We've got to preach it. To call for the elders and let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Yes, there are conditions to be met. I don't know why they don't always get healed. I know there are reasons why they don't, and it isn't from God's side, because he puts five or six conditions right in that one passage. And from Genesis to Revelation, there are conditions. And people can look you in the eye and say that there's nothing in their heart that's wrong, and God knows better, and they won't get healed. Because God says, you better get your heart right before I heal you. But what can be plainer than that sound doctrine? And who do you know, I mean spirit-filled, who would even think to call the elder first? They think you've lost your mind when you say call the elder. Well, they want prayer, but they don't want the elder. Not first, anyway. As so one Pentecostal pastor said to me, who heard this strong faith word that we preach, he said, half the time I meet the doctor going out or coming in when people get sick. They'll call me to come and pray, but they call the doctor first. And so we are living in the time when people can't endure sound doctrine. Now some people will compromise the plain word of God just to get a following, like we're told in Acts 20, 30, you know, they will gather disciples unto themselves. He says, of your own selves men will arise teaching perverse things. Paul talks about in Galatians 1 about perverting the gospel of Christ. They'll teach perverse things. You see, they're not denying the blood atonement. But they're teaching perverse things, perverting the word of God to draw disciples after themselves. Shepherdship covering movement is a good example of that. In fact, they call it making disciples for themselves. And others 
out of fear of the people will compromise the word of God and water it down and not say what God said, even when they know what God said, because they know if they preach it, they're going to be without a job. They'll have to get out of that religious stall where they're being fed Sunday after Sunday, getting their paycheck. Get out of this religious stall and get out and maybe have to work for a living for a while. Oh, pastors are not going to give up their meal tickets to preach the word. I know from experience. But those who've heard from God, those who've met Jesus face to face, aren't afraid to preach the word. Amen. And God will judge those who don't. I have been threatened. I have been invited to resign. I've been everything that you can imagine, I suppose, because I preach a strong word. First Baptist Church said, we don't care if it is the word. We can't handle it here. Kentucky Children's Home, you're going to be fired if you keep preaching that word. We went on preaching it anyway. What else could we do? We didn't get fired, the superintendent did. <laughs> Who told us we'd be fired? But I've been fired. I was told in the seminary, you either compromise or go. Well, I didn't compromise, and of course, I naturally went because I'm here <laughs> and not there. Oh, but people say that's institutionalism. You know, they don't have the Spirit of God. They can't stand a strong word because they just have the dead letter. But charismatics will take a strong word, won't they? Will they? <laughs> well, there's them that does and there's them that don't, as the saying goes. <laughs> Only the naive say amen when you say charismatics will receive a strong word. That must mean that they haven't been given charismatics a strong word. You want to get an education who will receive a strong word? Just take them. The total faith message. I'm talking about spirit-filled now. Take them the strong word. Oh, of course there are those who receive it. We didn't say that. But I think you'll find they're in the minority. Take the strong faith message. Take the God doesn't need doctors and medicines to heal you message. Take the apostolic method of baptism in Jesus' name by immersion in water message. Take the deeper life crucified, pick up that cross and follow Jesus' message. And see how many after you get done preaching in your tent rush up to you and say, Praise God for that strong word. Oh, I've been waiting for somebody to come along and give me the whole counsel of God so I could rush out and obey it. <laughs> oh, my. Don't wait to get mobbed. You won't. But that isn't the whole story. Thank God there are many out there who do say that. But I'll tell you, we're living in the time that Paul predicted when they won't endure sound doctrine. And for everyone who will receive what I just said, there'll be 10,000 who won't. And they can talk in tongues, too. Time and again, people have written to us praising God for the deep word that comes out of faith assembly and how it's changed their lives. Letter after letter. You'd be surprised how many of them in the same letter say, but, but our charismatic friends think we've gone off the deep end. You might be amazed how many times they say, they've quit fellowshipping with me. There's a cost for the strong word. Amen. Praise God for those who receive it. But our mail tells us there are a lot of people not receiving it. But praise God they're willing to pay the cost to stay with it. They've been accused of being Freemanites and everything else. Well, that's ridiculous. If you hear the shepherd's voice, the sheep will follow him because Jesus said, My sheep will hear my voice. They'll follow me. Now, if all you hear in these meetings is my voice, one of us has missed it. And I think I've done enough preaching and public admonishment don't glorify me or any minister in this body that we can pretty soon tell who missed it if all you're hearing is my voice. I'm not going to take the blame because I've already said I won't even show up if you try to give me any of the glory for what God has done and is doing through this ministry. And he hasn't even begun to do what he's going to do. No, the Bible says that his sheep will hear his voice. And if you're one of his sheep, you'll be able to hear his voice through us as we minister. You won't hear us. And that's the test of any man's ministry. Is he building a following somewhere? We could have churches all over, including Canada and Australia. That isn't what God sent us to do. And I don't mean that he doesn't send people and apostles to establish churches. But I mean he didn't send us to establish a following. Freemanites. Like the vision one sister shared with us about this ministry. We share it with you because we've already, I uh, trust, humbled ourselves enough in your sight that you know we're not glorifying ourselves. Well, I didn't give her the vision, so we'll just report it. 
And if anybody has problems with the word or visions that God gives, as I say, take it up with heaven because that's where they come from. She said, I saw you preaching the word. And of course, we can just say this ministry. You don't have to think of me. The ministry of the word out of this body. Praise the Lord, she said, as you preach this strong word in this vision. She said, there was God's garden out there and beautiful flowers began to sprout forth and plants. They began to sprout forth in all sorts of beautiful colors and said as those plants began to come forth, those beautiful flowers, they hid you from view and all I could see was the top of your head. And Jesus was there jumping and dancing and praising, you know, just happy because he saw what was being produced by a pure word. And he says, and see, you're wondering about him. Well, you can't see him because as he preaches my word, he gets hidden. And all he sees what is produced with his word. And he would gather those beautiful plants and take them to you. To you. And he said, as she would offer them to most of you, your hearts would open. And he'd put those plants into your heart. And you receive that beautiful word in your heart. And it would change you. But he said there were some that stood like this when he offered them the word. He's talking about you. Some, he said, they wouldn't take it. They didn't recognize it as anything they wanted. They despised it. But the significance is that Jesus takes what we give when it's a pure word and gives it to the people. And that means, dear friends, if we compromise his word or distort it or water it down to please men or to please anybody, he has nothing to give you. He's not going to take your old creeds and Baptists and Methodists and Catholic doctrine and manology and offer his people because it'll kill them, it'll destroy them, it'll bind them. You've got to give him a pure word or he's got nothing to offer the people. And he was rejoicing in the word that comes out of this ministry. And all glory to him because it's his word. And that means, dear friends, that he needs us to preach a pure word because, you see, he doesn't speak directly and shout down out of heaven. He's waiting for us to sow the seed. It produces something he can offer you. Sad, sad, those who couldn't receive it. God tells Ezekiel here, if he doesn't preach that word, that he's going to require it at the minister's hands. He tells him over in chapter 2 to go preach my word to a people who won't even hear it. Sometimes it's that way. You say, why go preach? Well, he said, because then they'll know there's been a prophet of God among them. See, it's not your calling, not your responsibility to get people to believe the word. Your calling is to preach it, to witness to it, to testify to it. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility, to get them to believe it. That's why you see all these gimmicks and techniques and psychology used in some of the tents and churches to get people down to an altar to weep some crocodile tears, and they have to get them down there week after week and month after month and year after year. God can change you in that seat. Then your life's changed. But if I have to sing 20 courses to get you down here and plead and shed some tears so you'll start shedding some tears and give you all sorts of tales about how somebody died and somebody got saved as a result of it and all that. That is psychology. God doesn't need that. Oh, you should shed tears for the lost. You should pray and intercede. That isn't what we said. But he told Ezekiel it wasn't his responsibility to get Israel to believe it. He said it's your responsibility to give them what I put on your lips. Well, anyone ought to know that if he had any sense. Psychological gimmicks and all of this business that we see in evangelism for the most part today. This is man's methods. Selling the gospel. You're a salesman. Anybody in the right mind ought to know that won't work. Because you can't convict a sinner, only the Holy Spirit can. You can get him emotionally disturbed. You can get him to join something. But you can't change him. You can't create faith in anybody's heart. You can't change a leopard's spots. But the Holy Spirit can. 
and get it in your heart, the burden to be faithful to what you've learned, to what God has said in His Word. And do your praying and your pleading and your agonizing at your altar. And then when you give them that word, give it with the firm conviction that you're faithful to God. And some are going to believe it because the Holy Spirit will open their hearts to receive it. Hallelujah. I was sent a copy of a vision from a brother. In fact, he used to be one of my students in the seminary. I'd like to read it to you. A copy of a vision which... A brother, a friend, acquaintance of his over in Germany had. This is a brother I think I mentioned last week who gets in and out of Russia with his Bibles and preaching, and it's a miracle. He was one of my students in the seminary, graduate student, came to work on his doctor's degree from Denmark. And right away, we all spotted something different about him. That was before Pentecost. You know, when I was in the seminary, that's before Pentecost. Couldn't figure out. He was almost mystical, very spiritual. <laughs> and then I heard the seminary president say, well, he believes in speaking in tongues. Which meant, you know, that that's why he's so odd. And of course, later then we discovered that the reason he was odd is because he had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He came to our church after we became charismatic and took a picture of our group and took it over to a brother in Denmark. And he said, well, I've been praying for him for 14 years. God gave me a vision of that man, meaning Hobart Freeman, said he's going to fill him with the Spirit, raise him up in this end time, and he'll be an instrument in his hands. Well, this is that brother that is relating this vision. This is a tremendous thing. It shows what God is going to do with ministers, and that would include you. Because we're all ministers of the Word to some degree, if they're unfaithful to His Word. Now this is the vision, and listen carefully to it, because it's most solemn. I was in the midst of a great meeting hall, you know, a church, and the walls and ceilings were covered with jewels and ornaments everywhere, and the windows were made of colored glass, a typical cathedral. The hall was full of people, some rich, some poor, some sick, crippled, deaf, mute and blind, but all had chains on. In fact, they were handcuffs, and no one was free. Picture of today's church, you see. They're in church, but they're not free. In front of the meeting hall was a large platform with a pulpit on the one side and a large cage on the other with a huge green serpent in it. And hanging over where the speaker would stand was a great sword suspended by two strings horizontally. And on the platform were several ministers, eight or ten, clothed in clerical robes, sitting one behind the other, one seated just a little above the other, you know, in a single file. And the assembly looked upon these men, and they looked upon the church. And there was silence for a while, until a thundering voice sounded from the pulpit as if it came directly from God, saying, Who will declare the whole counsel of God? And the first clergyman arose with a Bible in his hand, and when he did, the old green serpent uncoiled and stretched out, hissing against the man with sparkling eyes and protruding fangs. And the man of God falsely so-called, sank back into his seat and placed his Bible under his chair. And when the serpent stretched up its head and touched the sword, he said to that man, Anyone who obeys the voice of God, I will kill with this sword. And for a little while there was silence again. And then the voice sounded from the pulpit again, Who will declare the whole counsel of God? And then the second man in clerical robes arose as if he would step forward. But again the serpent uncoiled against him, and he tumbled back with fear, sat down and placed his Bible under his chair, hiding the word. The serpent again touched the sword, and with the same remark said, With this I will kill you if you obey the voice of God. And for the third time the voice from the pulpit thundered, and a third man arose and sat down again like the two before him. And again and again the voice sounded until each of the clergymen had had an opportunity to resist the serpent, but fear overcame them all, and like the first three had been overcome, they sat down, and the serpent smiled with his evil smile. And then the voice sounded again from the pulpit, Oh, if there were a man! Oh, if there were a man! Oh, if there were a man who would declare the whole counsel of God that these chained men might be set free! Is there not one man? And then a man of little stature, meaning he was nothing in the sight of the world, 
A man of little stature ascended the platform and stood under the sword. And he lifted up his eyes toward heaven and said, Into thy hands, O God, I commit my spirit. Then he opened the Bible and read. He did not add anything to it. He did not take anything from it. He read the word and spoke as a man having authority. And when he had finished, the old serpent stretched up to the edge of the sword and cut off one of the strings holding the sword in place. And the sword swung down but missed him, passed over his head because he was a man of little stature. And the weight of the sword made the other string to break. And the sword flung back and pierced the hearts of those clergymen who were lined up in a line and nailed them to the wall. And a great scream of despair sounded from the platform. But an even greater scream of joy sounded from the assembly, for every man's chains were loosed and he was set free. By the word. By the word. And when this vision had vanished... I saw another vision of the Savior in a cloud just above my head. He spoke, saying, Hear, my son, the meaning of these things. The meeting hall which you saw is the secularized church, having a form of godliness but denying the power of it. They are all covered with the jewels of the joys of this world, and there is no end of their silver and gold. The people which you saw are those for whom I died, but my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They are truly in bondage and must be set free. You see why we don't hesitate to come out against institutional religion invented by man. Some of you have not always been able to stand that strong word as you've confessed you needed deliverance from denominational spirits. But I'll tell you, the vision is in line with our message and our message is in line with the word. You see why we are concerned about giving you a whole word because he said they've got ears and eyes but they can't see or hear they're perishing he said the platform which you saw on which the clergymen were sitting the platform is the preconceived ideas having their origin from the pit of hell the pulpit is the throne of God and the serpent old Lucifer himself the sword which you saw is the word of God and the strings in which it was hanging mean the power of the word to give life or the power of the word to take life. Life was given to the man of little stature and life was taken from the clergyman which did not preach my word. The clergymen which you saw are men from every church who pretends to know me but they teach my people things which are not written in the book of life. And their pride and their presumption and their worldly spirit force them to obey Satan who is a liar and the father of lies. And each of the clergymen tries to exceed the other in eloquence, in extensive writings, in argumentation and the like. But they only consider the letter of the word and leave out the spirit of the word. And the day will come and now is at hand when they shall all perish just like these. Strong language, it's in the word. I just read it to you in Ezekiel. After having considered this horrible scene, the Lord spoke again with these words. Do you remember my words in the prophecy of Jeremiah chapter 23 as well as my words in the prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 34? He said, read it. And I opened my Bible and read, Woe unto the shepherds that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. In the prophets I've seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in falsehood. That's a perversion of the word of God. And strengthen the hands of evildoers. At the end of the days you shall understand this clearly. Woe to the shepherds that feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? The weak you have not strengthened. Nor have you healed the sick. You've not bound up that which was broken. And neither have you brought again that which was driven away. And neither have you sought that which was lost, but with harshness and with rigor have you ruled over them. I will destroy the fat and the strong shepherds, of course, and I will feed them with judgment. Then he said to me, These false shepherds shall in no way escape when the sword falls upon them. But my sheep must be warned. They must be set free. And again he said, Do you remember my words in the prophecy of Jeremiah in the latter part of chapter 25? Read it. And I read these words, And the slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. How ye shepherds, for the day of your slaughter has come. 
Then he said to me, These days shall come quickly, the shepherds shall howl, yea, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, but when the sword has fallen, it will be too late forever. The man whom you saw who was of little stature is every man and every woman who will humble himself or herself and be obedient even to the death of the cross, putting his or her trust in God and going forward declaring the whole counsel of God. Oh, if I could find such a man, can you tell me where there is one with such a man? I could shake heaven and earth, saith the Lord. I'll tell you, I've never read a more soul-searching, solemn prophecy that's come out of charismatic circles yet. Oh yes, there are people who find it a little difficult when you come on strong and when you tell them denominationalism is Babylon, that's a spirit, that's not God, that Jesus didn't divide up his body into 260 pieces. And there are people who are stressing, let's have a spirit of unity instead of unity of the spirit. They're setting their own terms for what unity God wants to accomplish in this hour. They're setting their own terms for how it's going to be brought about. It's unity. We all have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we speak in tongues or we're all saved. That isn't the basis of unity in the Word of God. You have to have that for unity, of course. That is not its basis. In a previous message, as we showed you, the basis is the Word of God. The Word of God. There is a place for getting together and God help us to love our Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Holiness, Pentecostal brothers and sisters and praise God for the full gospel businessmen who get them together and God's Spirit gets poured out and they come to life in their old dead churches. We've never said anything but good for that. But where they're to be faulted, and God has called me to point these things out, is when they say doctrine is not important. God never sent them with that message. He sent them with the Holy Ghost message. But He never sent them with that message. Because when you say doctrine is not important, only love, you're saying the Word of God is not important, and God does not say that. He says it's of vital importance, because my people are perishing for lack of knowledge. People think because they talk in tongues and profess Jesus that they can't perish for lack of knowledge. They are perishing. They're following men today out of every ism and deception in the world. We're seeing it happen before our eyes where people are following deceptions. Well, if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want to give you a little bit of exhortation out of the New Testament aspect of that. That's all based on Ezekiel 33 and the vision this brother shared with us. 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 3, the term doctrine, he says they will not endure sound doctrine, preach that doctrine. The term doctrine in verse 3 is equated with the word in verse 2 and with truth in verse 4, which means sound doctrine is the word of truth which corresponds exactly to what God set forth. And any deviation by contrast, do you notice what Paul calls it? A fable. And in the context here, a fable is a synonym for the doctrine of men as contrasted to the doctrine of God. Teachings of man contrasted to the teachings of God. And the context shows us there are multitudes of people who are following fables. The ideas and teachings which have their source in the mind and imagination of the men who teach these things are contrary to the Word of God. Charismatics are no exception. You'll still have to go a long way to get a whole council, even among charismatics. And the Bible doesn't hesitate to call them fables. We know what fables are. That's what men teach. Well, what is sound doctrine? Because he says the time's coming when nobody will endure it, or very few. Let me give you a definition of sound doctrine. It's precise agreement in every detail between our beliefs and teachings and the Word of God. That's what sound doctrine is. Precise agreement in every detail between our beliefs and our teachings and the Word of God. Any deviation, however slight, I don't hesitate to tell you tonight by the anointing of the Holy Spirit on my lips to say it, any deviation is a fable. 
Now, I recognize that's strong doctrine because it's sound doctrine. But perhaps you need a few examples to show you that I know what I'm talking about. You know as well as I do that most Christians think it really doesn't matter how you baptize. And God spent quite a bit of time telling us how to do it and what it meant. You can sprinkle, you can sprinkle infants even, you can pour, you can immerse face forward, face backward, dip three times, try an immersion, single immersion in the Trinity, single immersion in the name of Jesus. And most people really think it doesn't matter how you baptize. Well, Jesus didn't teach all those ways. And when we tell people that doctrine doesn't matter, then we are confusing them because it confuses the meaning of the rite itself, which is testifying to our death in Christ Jesus. The Father and Spirit didn't die. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus, just like they did in the book of Acts, because we don't want to confuse our testimony. And when we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do not realize the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily, and the disciples who received that commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 went right out and fulfilled it by baptizing into the name of Jesus, who is the fullness of the Godhead. And four times in the book of Acts, it tells you they did it that way, and not once ever did they use trine immersion until the second century. That is, the Trinity formula. And you tell people that it doesn't matter, then the rite itself becomes meaningless. Why bother? Let's just forget it. But it testifies everywhere in the New Testament, everywhere in the New Testament, testifies to our death into the death of Jesus Christ. Christ died and was buried and rose again. It is important what you believe about it. And it confuses people, like I told you once before about a missionary friend over in the Philippines, this is many years ago, wrote and said how the natives, one native at least said to him, he's confused. He says, you Baptist immerse, that's back when I was a Baptist, you Baptist immerse the Methodist sprinkle, got one doing it this way and one doing it that way. He said, I'm all confused. Which one of you am I supposed to believe? So to say the least, it ministers confusion as to the meaning of the rite, and it confuses the people who would want to be baptized. That's why we don't hesitate to say man's religion has changed, has distorted, has perverted, and sometimes eliminated altogether the clearest teachings of the Word of God, saying it really doesn't matter. Love and unity is the only thing we're to be concerned about in this hour because we've never been able in 2,000 years to get together on the Word of God, so let's lay that aside and love one another. That isn't even biblical love. And like those Baptists said in Texas, I read it in a religious newspaper, so I'm reporting what happened. Those Baptists in Texas, association of churches, Baptists have what they call associations, independent churches, but you all better believe alike or you'll find out you're not so independent. And those churches that were beginning to become charismatic, they were casting them out. And those who were receiving the baptism said, well, wait a minute, it's taught in the Word of God. And you know what the reply was? It was right in the paper printed. The reply was, we don't care what the Bible says about this experience. We don't practice it in our church. Now, if you think that's an isolated exception to something, you just haven't been to church. Well, Jesus says in Matthew 15, 9, in vain they worship me because they're teaching for the doctrines of God the commandments of men. It matters to God what we teach. But what he says, as I said before, means little or nothing to those who do not have sound doctrine. You know, it's a mystery to me how many people can read the same New Testament I do and come up with some of the most unsound teachings that you've ever heard of. The same New Testament, which again and again tells you that God resists every distortion or perversion of his word with all of his wrath and spirit. Have you read Galatians? Have you read Corinthians? Have you read 1 and 2 John? Have you read Timothy? Have you read Thessalonians? Have you read the New Testament again and again? God resists any perversion of his doctrine, resists both that perversion and the person who perverts it. In all of those epistles, all through the New Testament, Jesus said they're worshiping me in vain because they're not teaching what the Word of God says. 
It's a mystery to me also why that in every area of our lives, from following a recipe to bake a cake to following a road map to get to some destination, from the study of history to sending a spaceship to the moon and back, in every area of our lives, accuracy and truth are virtues to be desired. Because without accuracy and truth, you might get a spaceship to the moon, but with all the complexities in that thing, 400,000 parts, it just might not get back. And so in every area of our life, of man's life, in or out of the church, accuracy and truth are virtues in every area but one. And that's the Word of God, because here, in the Word of God, in Christianity, faithfulness to the whole counsel of God is not considered a virtue, but a fault. Oh, he doesn't love anybody. It's a mark of a lack of intelligence that you take literally the Word of God. Go ahead and believe it, but keep it to yourself. Accuracy about the Word of God will cause some of your best charismatic friends to call you a religious fanatic and a bigot. Or you're ultra conservative. In every area of life, accuracy and truth are held as virtues except in Christianity because they know accuracy and truth are essential to guaranteeing sometimes you'll get back when you start out with your car. You won't be killed. Your life, your welfare, your financial status depends on being accurate. But when we come to the Word of God and eternal matters, suddenly everybody, almost everybody, becomes vague and indifferent. You'll hear people whine, well, in the matter of religion, everybody has a right to worship God the way he thinks is right, and how do we know they're not right and maybe we're wrong? Well, you better know you're right. Amen. You better know who's right and who's wrong. And to express their unwillingness to take a bold stand alongside God and His Word. You hear all of these terms today, don't be a religious bigot. Don't be a religious fanatic. Be tolerant. Love is greater in doctrine. I'm still searching for that verse. Love is greater in doctrine. We should have unity in diversity, which is another contradiction, even in life, let alone about the Word of God. And it's a brave individual indeed who will stick his neck out today and stand with Jesus and Paul and the apostles and the prophets and the early saints and say with Isaiah, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Stand up in public and say that. It's a brave man. Brave man that will stand with Jesus and says, Anyone who teaches the doctrines of men for the commandments of God is perverting my word and he is in vanity and I don't even receive it. It's a brave man to stand with Paul and say as he does here in Galatians 1, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other word to you than that which you heard, let him be accursed. It takes a brave man to stand up and say, God said preach that word. Folks, open your Bibles, get ready, here it comes. And then read something like Acts 2 or James 5. He's a brave man. This is the hour when accuracy and truth are faults rather than virtues as they're supposed to be. I know out of 26 years experience, I know what I'm talking about here, that the teacher of the Word of God is actually expected. If he's going to hold his pulpit or be invited back to a lot of charismatic meetings, he's expected to be vague, compromising. Tolerant of all kinds of religious views and error. And in, under no circumstances ever offend anybody. Oh, I'll tell you, the quickest way to get on a blacklist is to tell people it's in the Word of God. It doesn't matter if it's in the Word of God because vagueness, mediocrity, religious tolerance of all kinds of error are demanded. Now, some of you maybe haven't traveled as much as us, but you won't be invited back some places. Praise God, some you will. Well, there's some places, like they said, don't have him back up here. He comes on too strong with that message of faith. Oh, we can't handle that. First Baptist Church, we don't care if it is the Word of God. We don't want that here. It's like salt in a wound. We can't live that. Well, if that strikes you as odd, I had seminary students preparing for the ministry that I was teaching that said, uh, go out of the class shaking their head. I can't live that. That's impossible. Sermon on the Mount is all it was. <laughs> You'd have thought I said, everybody that's going to follow Christ, you come over here, I've made me a big eight-foot cross, and I'm going to hammer nails in there till you're dead. 
You thought I said everybody that's going to forsake all has to forsake a leg or an arm. Come up here, I've got a saw, I'm going to work on you. No, all I said was, here's what he said, let's put it into practice. Well, in 2 Timothy 4, he tells us here that the time will come they won't endure sound doctrine. I'd like for you to turn to Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. And I want to show you that what Paul said is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon said that. There's nothing new. Isaiah 30. It's right down the line with what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 8 to 10. Now go... God says to the prophet, write it before them on a table, note it in a book, literally on a scroll, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Now look at the message. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the word of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits, 2 Timothy 4, heap to themselves teachers who will say what they want to hear. Prophesy to us not right things, but illusions, deceits, pleasant things, illusions, fables, is what Paul calls it. Haziness about doctrine today is looked upon as a virtue. Haziness, vagueness, has become a virtue. And anyone who says, I know what God said, said what he meant, meant what he said, and here's what he said, <laughs> is a religious bigot who's intolerant, hurts people's feelings. You know, there was a time when Christians in the churches, I'm talking about you can be a Christian today apparently and not know a thing. Look in the index to find Genesis. There was a time when a Christian was ashamed not to know the Bible he said he believed. There was a time when he'd be ashamed to be vague and indecisive about the doctrines that were basic to the Christian faith. But now it's a virtue. That's a mark that he's tolerant. He loves everybody. He's not dogmatic. And so religious deviations today are being substituted for convictions and we call them essentialism. Let's get together. Let's have some shouting meetings together. You believe in Jesus? Well, it doesn't matter what church you belong to. You believe in Jesus? You believe the Bible's inspired? You believe in the doctrine of the resurrection? I'm trying to think some more that we get together on because, you know, I started to say heaven and hell, but some are not sure about that. That's about it, the essentials. They had an article in the Charismatic Magazine by a woman who would not state clearly. I mean, she's accepted everywhere in Charismatic circles. But she wouldn't state clearly she believed in the doctrine of hell. Literal hell. Now, I don't know if any of you caught that. Her only answer was, well, I believe there's a lot of hell on earth right now. She was accused of not believing in it. And, of course, anyone who can read, anyone over three years old could see she doesn't believe in it by her answer. Well, people are having plenty of hell on earth now. Something to that effect. But you see, that isn't the whole story because many people, though, who say they believe in these things that we've mentioned don't always mean what you mean by what you said. Amen. I can prove that. Take the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture. Amen. Every true Christian says he believes in that. I can prove to you they don't. Amen. Because most of them don't obey the clearest things in that Scripture they say they believe is inspired. And you could start with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7. Or you could start anywhere, healing or tongues or whatever. They not only don't obey it, but they will put in their creeds many times things that clearly contradict what the Word of God says. And yet they say they believe the Bible's inspired. And many, now I'm really going to get to meddling, many, many who call themselves full gospel don't have a full gospel, don't believe a full gospel. And if you go preach a full gospel, you'll be the first to realize they oppose a full gospel. I'm talking about spirit-filled saints who are called full gospel, loosely so called. They don't believe in a full gospel. You take them a full gospel. Like, healing means call the elders, not the doctors. Right away you'll see they don't believe in a full gospel. Well, we leave that aside. Tongues, the initial evidence of the baptism. Well, now, wait a minute, you'll hurt somebody's feelings. A lot of good people out there don't speak in tongues have been baptized in spirit. And there are a lot of people who say they believe in the inspiration of Scripture, but don't believe that... 
1 Corinthians 14, 39 is inspired. Forbid not speaking in tongues. Because they'll tell you no sensible Christian be caught dead speaking in tongues. Are they of the devil? And if you think they believe in all of the inspiration of the Bible, you say you believe in your church that that's inspired too, and you'll find out they don't believe that's inspired, and you'll be out on your ear if you practice that inspiration. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, Forbid not to speak in tongues. Now, occasionally this has gotten some people in trouble with Hobart Freeman because they thought the terms I was using were the same ones that they were using. That is, that we meant the same thing. And they'll hear you preaching a message of faith in one of your faith seminars or hear a tape or read your faith book and they'll say, oh, that's what we need in our church. That's the answer. That's what's missing. We need that faith message. Will you come? And some of them found when you get there, too late they found out that what you meant by faith and what they thought faith was are not even remotely related. That faith isn't believing God while the doctors operate. They start hearing that over their pulpit. And the faith isn't trusting God to supply your needs through the finance company. And the faith isn't believing God will give you the wisdom to have enough insurance so you won't get caught short in case of an accident. And they find out too late they called the wrong person. Don't ever call a person who believes in faith to preach faith unless you want to hear faith. And I generally know which ones would never invite you back. And they weren't sitting out there resisting the word openly. I'm not saying that. But I can name you the places that I knew after a five-day, eight-day meeting or whatever, they would never have you back in 10,000 years. <laughs> and they were smiling on the outside when they said, Thank you, Brother Freeman, for coming. But the Lord showed me they weren't smiling on the inside. They couldn't handle that strong faith message. Well, it's their own fault. Don't you ever call a man to preach the whole council who will come and preach the whole council. They use those terms, you see. Whole council of God. Oh, we need that strong word. Don't have him back up here. He did what we told him. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, anybody who's read 2 Timothy here and Ezekiel 33 and 34 and Jeremiah chapter 23 and all of these passages that we read from this prophecy... Don't ever call him to preach in your church unless you want to hear those things. Now we're not saying that we shouldn't be tolerant and love these people even if we think they're wrong about some things. None of this is intended to imply that we should be intolerant. But when tolerance is substituted for compromise and when the term love is a disguised to mask your unwillingness to pay the cost of going all the way with Jesus, then you'd be doing yourself and the people a favor yourself because on Judgment Day you'll be glad you did. You'd be doing yourself and the people a favor if you unmask a lot of these foggy notions about love and tolerance and patience and tell them most of the time these are just excuses for compromise. You'd be doing yourself and the people a favor if you would do that because the time's going to come when God's going to, He's going to be doing it before Judgment Day. He's going to start judging some of these who are lifting terms out of His Word. Love, tolerance, and using them indiscriminately to mask their own unwillingness to pay the cost of the threats of the serpent and that sword. Don't you think we're not being threatened and will be threatened for this whole council? Amen. And many have paid the cost. Many have paid the cost. Old Dad Humbert bled from beatings on his back until the blood ran down his shoes for preaching the word. When he got saved, he said, Lord, which denomination should have joined? There three churches in town, Methodist, Pentecostal, Baptist, I believe, doesn't matter. We could name three others. He said, which one's your church so I can join? He said, none of them. Oh, people have trouble digesting what God says. He said, none of them. He said, I'm calling you to preach my word. You get involved in any of those, you won't preach my word. You'll preach what men tell you to preach. You better believe it. Don't you ever let the devil deceive you into going back in some old dead system. You're going to get them all filled with the Holy Ghost and take a pastor like that. Don't you ever believe it. God didn't call you out to put you back in chains. He broke the handcuffs with his word because a man of little stature stood up. 
and read what God said and didn't add anything to it, didn't take anything from it. God will judge those who do. God's going to judge those who use the terms out of his Bible and just twist them and pervert them and apply them in situations where they can never be applied. You can't use love out of the wrong context when you're really saying, I really don't want to tell this brother or sister what they need to hear. That isn't love, that's hate. The Bible says that's hate. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 25 that you hate your son if you don't discipline him. Yes, he that hateth his son, he starts out, spares the rod. But he that loveth him disciplines him diligently. King James said betimes, but that just means diligently when he needs it. Now, I don't discipline my neighbor's children. Why? For the same reason you don't. You don't have the same loving concern for them. No way you could. If you really loved them as much as your children, you'd go over and give them a spanking when they need it. You really would. But God doesn't expect you to do that. And you can't express the same loving concern. If you really love your child, you will discipline him when he needs it. Yes, we know, not with a sledgehammer or a baseball bat. You don't have to say that. But firmness and love go hand in hand because in spite of all the arguments of the child psychologist to the contrary, permissiveness is not evidence of love. But love is expressed in discipline, God says. Jesus did not say, blessed are they who tolerate religious error. He said, if you don't preach my word, their blood I hold at your hands. That's for every one of you. That isn't just for Hobart. If you want to know why Hobart will preach to the empty chairs and the tent poles if he has to, is because he has met the one. He has met the one who said, this is my word. Don't you tamper with it. And the men who tamper with it, he's going to judge. And I can say with the Apostle Paul that we've not handled the word of God deceitfully in this church. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with his gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And I can say one thing with all sincerity on the day of judgment. Paul says he doesn't judge himself just be wasting his time. Only Christ can judge us. We shouldn't judge one another because we can't even judge ourselves or right. But there's one thing I know. That by his grace, I won't have to apologize to any of you. That we have not handled his word deceitfully to you. And we do oppose and we resist with all of the anointed power the Holy Spirit will give us. We do resist this old watered down view today that the important thing is to keep the channels of communication open. Keep the dialogue going. Don't say anything that will close the channels. Agree to disagree. And even if you believe something, don't press your beliefs too strongly or someone may get the idea that you're trying to convert them to your views. <laughs> Poor Paul. He wasted a whole New Testament trying to convert people to his views. And he didn't hesitate. And he said, if anyone doesn't believe it the way I preached it, he's under a curse. Wow. Well, you say he's an apostle. Well, the Galatians didn't think so because they listened to the Judaizers. And he had to write the letter to straighten them out. And even then it's up to them to believe it or not. To believe that old dead gospel of compromise and dead works are the gospel of salvation by faith. But people who say that you shouldn't stress your views even if you know they're right and based on the word. It makes me wonder if they've ever read this Bible. Because they have, they can't prove it. And to say the least, they don't take God seriously because he said, preach that word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, light has no fellowship with darkness. He said, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. He said to Titus in Titus 2.15, these things speak. What I've told you, Titus, you go teach them and exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no man dispute your word. Oh, that's the New Testament way to preach. It makes religious marshmallows uncomfortable, but that's the way that God said we better preach it. 
Haziness and compromise may make you popular with the crowds out there, but it'll not make you popular with him up there or with Jesus' sheep because his sheep hunger and thirst after righteousness. And God's promise is they're going to be filled. He'll find a man of small stature who will fill them. And if you give them those compromising husks of your opinion and religion, they'll recognize that right away and they'll spit it out. It's like the old German shepherd I had back in the days when we used the pills, you know. Had dogs and used the pills to treat them and you'd try to worm him and put a worm pill right in the middle of a ton of dog food and he'd eat the whole thing, the pill would be in the bottom of his bowl. <laughs> he wasn't about to touch that old man's substitute for God's created food that he knew was good for him and that was a bunch of junk that he wasn't putting in his stomach. He had some sense. Christ's sheep are not going to eat those old pills you offer them. Pills of man's theology. Jesus said, My sheep love my word, delight themselves in the word of the Lord, and in the word of the Lord they meditate day and night. And if you give them anything less than the word of God, they've got nothing to meditate on. So they're just going to turn away from you. His sheep will, and they'll find some place where there's some grass. Jesus said, My sheep will hear my voice, and they'll follow me. And another shepherd, he said, they'll not follow John 10, even if he says he's their shepherd and their covering and they better follow him or they'll perish or won't get any revelation. His sheep won't follow those shepherds out of Florida or South America or wherever. His sheep won't. Well, somebody says, I know somebody did for a while. Well, for a while. His sheep will hear his voice and they'll discern. Well, in conclusion tonight, I want to point you to something that some of you may not have observed in all of this because you say, well, everybody here, as far as I know, doesn't follow the teaching of man and they're going to follow the Word of God. But there's an area where you have to be careful. And that is the danger. We're talking tonight about the importance of right doctrine resting on right convictions out of the Bible. And there's a danger of your having right convictions but just resting on them and not going on into all that God wants to teach you and show you out of his word. What I'm saying is, dear friends, we need this exhortation as much or more than the other and that is you can be 100% right about your convictions and still not have 100% of all the convictions the Holy Spirit wants you to have. And the only way you can get it is through your discipline of the Word, through trial and through experiences. Your convictions in the final analysis anyway are no better than what you know about the Word of God. Because we find some people have right convictions and the first thing you know, because they don't have all the convictions the Holy Spirit wants them to have, then they're inserting some of their convictions along with the Word of God. In this hour, God's only going to use those who have sound doctrine. He said the time's coming when men will not endure it. He's only going to use those who have sound doctrine. And I'll tell you where you find sound doctrine is going to be in the Word of God. Sound doctrine is going to be found in sound hearts. Sound hearts made sound because they pay the cost. God wants you to know through the message tonight as the Apostle Paul vindicated his message to those people with strong urgings that this church tonight is vindicating its ministry to you with the same exhortations and strong urgings not just to say praise the Lord another sermon another Wednesday came it's gone I've been to church I must be a little better off but for you to make the choice about whether or not the message is from heaven or it's just another ministry called faith ministries or whether this is the message of the hour like the vision said I didn't have it like the vision said Jesus leaping and rejoicing because this church did not compromise his word and was producing beautiful plants and flowers that he could offer the people so they could be changed and blessed by it with strong urgings we've tried to convince you that as God has allowed us to be put in trust with this gospel, we're speaking it to you, not as pleasing you, but pleasing God, which tries our hearts. 
And we have not handled the word of God deceitfully. Because, as Amos said, I was not a prophet or a prophet's son. But God said, go speak this to this people. And I've been faithful to him tonight to do it. And he sent that vision right after he gave me the message I gave you tonight. So they coincide. I've been saving that up for the right time. I save some things up for the right time. That's all right. Because sometimes you're not ready for it or whatever reason. That came right as this message was being given. Because the time's coming when you've got to make the choice where it's worth paying the cost to follow this message or take the easier route. You'll be in good standing in charismatic circles all over the country, with few exceptions, by taking an easier route. God is vindicating now by the sincerity of his servants his word to you. It's your responsibility to get in there to see if we're telling the truth. The day is coming when he'll vindicate it with signs. But you see, if he does that first, you'll start following signs. And when the signs stop, or we leave, he sends us on somewhere else, then the chairs will be empty. Half of them. Because you were following a man and signs. So he vindicates his word to your heart first. And he can't do that unless you open your heart and receive what he offers you. Just hearing it isn't receiving it. You haven't received anything tonight if you heard it with your ears. The vision, you open your heart. Nodding your head yes doesn't mean you believe the word of God unless that pumps your heart open. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stand with me. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we stand before you with our hearts open completely surrendered to the leading of your spirit knowing that we've been given a solemn warning tonight out of the word and out of revelation to your church that we are to discern in this hour truth from error man's word from God's word and so our prayer is that your people the sheep of your pasture will have their eyes fixed upon you and will be able to discern your voice through our voice and follow you, Lord Jesus, for we ask it in your name. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. For the Lord would say, I have looked for my throne in the heavens and I have seen a vain thing in the earth. I have seen men who have taken my word and handled it deceitfully. Yea, with all of their clerical garb and the crosses around their neck, they are not religious. For in vain they worship me. But more saith the Lord, around their neck hangs the keys into the kingdom, the keys of truth. And they're not loosing the people. They're not taking these from around their neck. They're not loosing the people from their bondage. And I will oppress them as they have oppressed my people. I will punish them as they have punished my people. I will rob them as they have robbed my people. I will take away from them understanding and give them confusion because they have given this to my people. But I have by my spirit, saith the Lord, set you free. And be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. But let the spirit of God who like a dove flies in the freedom of the heavens above. Let your spirit soar to the heights of the revelations of my truth in my word. And as you meditate upon my word day and night, yea, saith the Lord, you shall know what it is to be free in me. For the truth shall make you free, and he that hath the Son is free indeed. And let not men with all of their professions and exhibitions and demonstrations deceive you. 
but you follow this simple, plain path that my spirit will lead you in and I will lead you into the kingdom, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. And what God was showing as the basis of that prophecy was a faceless clergyman with his religious garb, black shirt, white collar, cross around his neck, and around his neck was a great ring with the keys into the kingdom. And he had them for himself, but he was not giving them to the people. He was not loosing them from their bondage. He was faceless because God says this is any clergyman. Any one of you, man or woman, who withholds the key of knowledge for my people. For I will judge, saith the Lord, he or she, who is of large stature, and who seeks to impress others, and ignores the simplicity and truth of my word. But he or she that is of little stature, I will hide him with his testimony. I will hide her with her witness. I will hide them with their anointed word so they can see me, saith the Lord, and enter in and be saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise the